The following program contains adult themes. Some scenes may be too intense for some viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. What happens when marriage vows are battered and broken? Tonight, a true story of love, obsession, and finally, bloodshed. was just covered with black and blue marks. She was beaten. It was incredible. She looked like a piece of meat out of, out of a butcher shop. It was incredible. He had raped me that night. He had beat me. He, because he believed that I was with someone else. And that split second when I got up and I took that knife in my hand, that knife was for me. Change the name and it could fit hundreds of cases of women, both in New York State and around the country. Edith, do you recognize the knife? Oh my God, what did I do? Fear is a horrible feeling. I understand it, as do most of us across the country. I'm Teresa Saldana, and this is Confessions of Crime. Here, we'll attempt to unravel the mystery of why violent crimes occur by probing into the minds of the criminals themselves. Our search will focus not only on what took place, but on why it happened. Understanding the mysterious origins of crime may be the only way to help avoid crime in the future. It's a subject that matters to me personally. Nine years ago, I was brutally stabbed by a total stranger. I've often wondered what was going through that person's mind before he decided to attack me. Should someone have known? And could that knowledge have prevented what that stranger did to me? But violence doesn't always come at the hands of strangers lurking here in the dark streets. Sometimes, it begins in a place where you feel no harm can come to you, where you feel most safe, inside your own home. How can this happen? Consider the case of Edith Mendez. Her strange and troubled tale begins in childhood, where Edith grew up the eldest daughter in a family with a physically ill mother and a strict father who never showed her the love she craved. He was an old-fashioned dad. And he was more of a disciplinarian, at least in my eyes, at least in my view than he was an affectionate father. And I remember one day, my sister and my kid brother were playing in bed with my dad. And I remember standing by a door and wanting so bad for him to say, come. And being so afraid to go to him because I wanted him to ask me. And it was okay for my sister and my brother to be there, but not for me. Because I was the older one. I was the one who was supposed to project a certain image. I wasn't supposed to be loved by my father. Is it possible that Edith, feeling alone and unwanted at home, was beginning a lifelong search for love and affection? While still in high school, she got married and had a child. This boyfriend, who is my daughter's father, did take me as a virgin, did assume a lot of things. And I assumed also a lot of things. I assumed that, see, my mother's marriage with my father was peaches and cream, and I assumed that that's the way every relationship was. And so, of course, I'm gonna be a peaches and cream wife. And I was. Obviously, there were certain things that I was not doing. 
I don't mean sexually, but whenever I reacted sexually, he made me feel so guilty and so dirty that I could not react anymore. In other words, you're not supposed to enjoy this. You're a good woman. You're a wife. You're a wife. Wives are not supposed to enjoy this. That marriage ended quickly and quietly after only a few months. Then Edith, still searching for a fulfilling love, met a man named Tony. She was very attractive. Um, um, I would say voluptuous. Um, she had, she was very bubbly. She had uh, very, very uh, high spirits. It was so funny, we had a big wedding. You know, all the, the whole nine yards, it was wonderful, it was wonderful. But even then, I didn't feel that we were lovers. I lived with Tony for a year and a half, lived in the same household where we lived as brother and sister. Even though we had our differences, um, she was always honest with me. And I felt that um, a person who was honest with me deserved a lot. My mom died in 1977. At that time, I was still married to Tony. Something happened to me then. It was though I had been relieved or I had been set free when my mom passed away, only I didn't realize it. I didn't realize that that's what was happening to me. I actually started dating someone else while I was still married. Edith and Tony were married for 10 years and had a son, Richie. But Edith still wasn't fulfilled. Then, her mother's death set Edith free to actively search for a satisfying emotional and sexual relationship, which she hadn't found so far, until she met Carlos. He brought out a part of me that I already knew was there. The exciting part, the womanly part, the sexy part, the, 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 the joie de vivre, as they say, wanting to be alive and feeling it and feeling good about it. He didn't make me feel dirty, at least not at first. He didn't make me feel dirty. He made me feel good, damn it. He made me feel really good. She was very much, oh, she was in love with him. He was the perfect Latin, um, handsome, romantic, um, very, very, um, you know, possessive and, and macho. And, um, and she, she seemed real happy. She was very passionately in love with him. Edith was in love with Carlos, and he seemed to be deeply committed to her, almost obsessed. How could Edith's newfound happiness disintegrate into violence and tragedy? The Carlos Edith saw was a very jealous man, and the focus of his life, of all his emotions, was Edith. At first, she found all the attention very flattering. She was in love. I was willing to give up a lot. I was willing to give up almost everything. For Edith, I believe that initially she had a strong need to uh, become involved in a relationship where she was made to feel very feminine, very sexually desirable, and very good about her, uh, about herself. Uh, unfortunately, the other aspects of the relationship became manifest fairly quickly. I did at one point give up my son. I gave him back to his dad. Because I was afraid that Carlos would hurt him. Because Carlos was so jealous. Carlos was so possessive. If I was obsessive, he was much more so. He was much more so. He was more of a, uh, a dominant person who, when he sat down at the table, he wanted to make sure that he was in charge. She didn't have no room, no space, you know, no air to breathe. It seemed like the only air she was breathing was the air that he was exhaling, you know? She would have to leave work precisely at the time indicated. God forbid she was asked to work a little bit later, but he would wait for her to make sure she came out of the right entrance of the building and went directly to the train station. One day he showed up at work and made it very ugly for me. And I was terribly, terribly embarrassed. When I went home, of course, he made it even worse at home. And my son 
was about 14 years old then. And when he came home and, and saw me on the floor, stripped naked, and Carlos was playing tic-tac-toe on my back with a knife, and not allow me to, to yell or scream because he had my mouth. And I told him, Richie, please leave. He says, no, mommy, I'm not leaving. I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him. That's when I realized how bad it was. She took me in um, to Xerox room. It was, you know, a private, a small little room. And she closed the door. And she lifted her shirt up. And her whole body was just covered with black and blue marks. She was beaten. It was incredible. She looked like a piece of meat out of, out of a butcher shop. You get hit once, and you get a black and blue mark. To look like raw meat, you've got to be pounded and pummeled over and over and over again. Kick marks, you could see where the toe of his boot had hit her under her ribs. She had broken ribs. It was very obvious what had happened. And that's when I asked her, I said, did, and I was afraid to ask her, you don't want to accuse, it's a sensitive thing. You don't just say, gee, is your husband beating you? But I asked her, I said, you know, is, did Carlos do this? Who did this? Did Carlos do this to you? And she very quietly and very meekly, she didn't even say yes, yeah, she just kind of nodded. I saw her uh, deteriorating emotionally, physically, it seemed. Her health was, was going, you know, her mental health was, I'd say it was just about gone because there wasn't much left to her, you know? It's called being trapped. It's called, I use the word isolation, but I know it goes beyond that. It's being trapped, it's being, not being, not being, because that's basically what it comes down to. You become a non-person. I was a non-person. I remember polishing my nails one day and wondering, why am I doing this? Who cares? When something that insignificant becomes so significant in your life, you know. <laughs> Edith knew she was trapped in a horrible, agonizing relationship. And for the first time, she reached out for real help. She called the police, but they were unable, perhaps unwilling, to step in. Edith even ran away from Carlos, but allowed herself to be lured back. At one point, she quit the job. Um, and she moved to Massachusetts, I believe. Uh, and I thought, that's great, all right? You're putting some distance between yourselves. You're doing it. Um, and he went and got her. That's, that's the nightmare, is that if I try and escape, one of the reasons you don't leave is because it's useless anyway. It seemed like the further she got away, the closer they were. So it seemed like when the few times that they separated, they were just closer, you know? The person is not evaluating the situation realistically. They're looking at it through the eyes of the batterer. Very often, they become compliant, and they see things the way the batterer wants them to see things, and they accept the guilt, and they become submissive, just to avoid the repeated battering and the repeated uh, exploitation that is leveled at them every day. She was absolutely convinced that he would not only not let her go, he would kill her if she ever tried to leave him. But in her mind at that point, it was because he loved her so much that he couldn't bear to leave her. That, that was a very, very powerful thing for her. This man loves me. He's willing to kill me, to keep me. At the same time that she feels he may kill her or that he's beating her constantly, uh, this is interspersed with periods where he's loving, he's contrite, he's remorseful, uh, he's uh, giving her a great deal of attention. And so these women are kind of torn. They, they don't know how to evaluate the situation. At one point where she really, um, she came to my house and she was a bloody pulp. I said, what, you know, <laughs> what happened this time? And she said, I stopped fighting back and he stopped hitting me. He said, I'm gonna kill you, I'm gonna kill you. I'm gonna just, I'm gonna kill you today. And she said, and I told him to do it finally. Just for God's sakes, do it, get it over with. I can't take it anymore. The victim is reduced to the level of a child in a way, or even beyond that, to an infant. 
Uh, they don't feel that they have any strength. They don't feel there's a way out. Uh, they don't feel their own individuality. They really are going along from day to day, just trying to minimize the beatings, trying to minimize the intimidation, and really trying to survive. At some point, you fight back. You either die, you know, you either lay down and you die, you let him beat you to death, or you, um, you fight back. And at this point, apparently, she could not face another beating. A woman, at, at, the, at the moment that she fights back, often is, is literally at the point of being in a dark tunnel um, uh, with no escape, with, a, with a, a speeding locomotive headed towards her. That, there, that she can't run, she can't go to either side, and if she doesn't do something, uh, she's gonna die. Feeling she had no one to turn to, beaten and abused by her husband, Edith was now truly alone. In a moment, we'll see how Edith's isolation led to one horrifying moment of violence. After three years of almost constant abuse and pain, Edith Mendez was lost, adrift in a sea of conflicting emotions. And on the night of September 17th, 1985, the pressure of loving and living with Carlos exploded in a moment of sudden violence. Edith came home. Carlos was there. At that split second, I believed and I knew that it was either him or me. He had raped me. And to say that a husband rapes you, I mean, nobody can believe that. Nobody can understand that. When he had raped me that night, he had beat me. He, because he believed that I was with someone else. And that split second when I got up and I took that knife in my hand, the knife was for me. The knife was not for Carlos. The knife was for me. So what happened? <laughs> Edith. I just took the knife and went to him and he was laughing because he knows I could never do anything like that. And I just put it in him. Okay, Edith. And we were fighting. Okay, you yeah. well, I just wanted him to get away from me, to stop hitting me, and to stop saying the ugly things. He said my daughter was trash, and my granddaughter was going to be trash, just like me. And my granddaughter's two years old. She's a baby. She's a... Where did you get the knife? <sighs> My God, help me. Edith, I'm going to show you. I love him, please. I'm going to show you uh, something, and I want to. showed you. Is that the knife that you used? And we have to recognize that the, 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 the situation a woman finds herself in is the equivalent, if you will, of a hostage, a captive. Uh, and one wouldn't be amazed if you um, uh, fought back against your captor uh, when his back was turned, when he was asleep, uh, when he didn't have the gun pointing at you. When the person's ego is just totally flooded and overwhelmed by, by uh, very strong emotion, uh, fear, terror, anger, desperation, and so forth. And it's at a moment like that that the person loses control. 
they lose control of themselves, and a lot of suppressed impulses, hostile impulses often, angry impulses burst forth. It's at times like that that people commit suicide often, and it's at times like that that an act such as this can take place. I, I can't live with what I did. I can't. I don't think anybody deserves to die. I don't think anybody deserves to be killed. I don't think, but that's the way I am. Now, whatever they're doing, it is not worth what they think is going to happen. Okay, I killed this guy, and I'm going to be free. Bull I'm sorry, but bull Because he's got you more in control now. I feel that Carlos has me more in control now than he did before. Because I am paying, and I'm going to continue paying. Mentally, emotionally, I'm going to continue paying. Edith Mendez pleaded guilty to manslaughter and served two years in prison. She's now living and working again as a free woman. The tragedy of her story is that it was almost predictable. Here was a woman who, although abused and hurt by her husband, still loved him. In a way, Edith even felt at times that it was her fault, that she had no way out, no way of stopping the cycle of beatings. If only she could have gotten more help. If only she would have left. If only Carlos's abuse could have been stopped. If only. But instead, Edith committed a crime. She found her answer in a moment of violent bloodshed. Ironically, in the same apartment building where Edith and Carlos lived, and where Carlos died, there is now, six years later, a haven for battered women, a place where wives like Edith can go for help and support. I'm Teresa Saldana. Join me again next week for another extraordinary journey into the criminal mind on Confessions of Crime.